Greetings, it is time for our monthly monetary creation report, which includes our inflation update as well. I do a version of this every month because we are getting closer and closer to an inflection point where these correlations that the rest of the world seems to have trouble figuring out will be harder and harder to ignore. And longtime viewers of this channel and readers of my Atom publication know about all this and how my predictions have been consistently correct because this is at the first principles level. So as always, we go to the Yardeni report over here. And these are the four central banks of the world that comprise the big four, so to speak. The United States, Eurozone, Japan, and China. They comprise 85 to 90% of all money printing, but these big four are the ones we look at because even though it's not 100% of all money printing, it is a vast majority of all of it. And this alone tells us that the United States is only about 30% of all cumulative money printing to date. The red line, $8.3 trillion, is what the United States has printed. Europe had actually done even more than the United States. Now it's about the same. But as you can see here, the United States is only a small fraction of all money printing. So all the screeching that you hear about that presumes that the U.S. is the only country in the world. The Federal Reserve printed so much money, therefore something priced worldwide like gold should go up, which of course it is not. That is already very anti-intellectual because the utter of that type of statement is tacitly assuming that the United States is the only country in the world and the only country that is doing money printing when it obviously is not. Now, as you can see all four major central banks are deprinting to varying degrees. This is not what they should do. Even though the large amount of money printing for COVID-19 was considered emergency money printing, that was in fact just keeping up with the proper trend line that printing should be on. Technological deflation is rising exponentially as a percentage of the total economy, as I've established very substantially on this channel and elsewhere, and money printing merely offsets that. That's why so much money printing has not caused aberrant inflation. Now, since only the worldwide total matters because technological deflation Inflation is a worldwide phenomenon, it knows no borders. We have to take the sum total of these four, which of course is always the chart after this. This is a neat sum total of all those four major central banks that you can see over here, 28 trillion printed as a total of those four. And it seems to be on an exponential curve. COVID-19 still only got it to an exponential curve. And even the deprinting that they're doing, it's somewhat meandering, it's treading water, and it is not going down as a total amount of money printing. Now, treading water is also not good because they're falling further and further behind the trend line. They would have to be here just to be at the trend line. So to catch up in two years, they will have to be about here. So another $9 trillion is what will be needed in just the next two years to catch up to the trend line. Now, when the stock market corrects or there's some other recession, that's what induces these central banks to print more and that's what will have to happen. And what is the gradient of this exponential curve? We see this chart right below, which is the compound annual growth rate. Now, I have long said that this number has to be between 16 to 24 percent a year, compound annual growth rate. That is how much money printing is needed just to offset technological deflation. And sometimes it peaks into that zone, but it's usually below that because the economists of the world who run the central banks still believe money printing is not normal and they're always trying to reverse it. They actually went into negative over here. Even during COVID-19, when this percentage annual growth rate got to 46.3% in February of 2021, since that time, inflation is not high at all, as we'll see later in this video in part two. Even I thought this is a level at which aberrant inflation can occur, but it only came for a very short time, only for a few months, and then it fell as quickly as it rose, as we shall see. And this number being negative is certainly going to cause turmoil in the markets at some point because it has to be in the 16 to 24% band, as has always been the case. Whenever they try to deprint, they're forced to print more money again, and this time will be no different. In fact, I say that their method of printing money might break, which is the purchasing of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities in the U.S. and the equivalent in the EU but to a lesser extent. Japan and China do a better, more enlightened form of money printing. So they're helping keep the whole world afloat versus this hyper-concentrated, distortive type of money printing done in the U.S. 
And now this chart also tells us a certain reality contrary to what you may be seeing in the media. This is total amount of money printing done by each of those four major central banks as a percentage of their annual GDP. Now this is a cumulative multi-year total, yes, and GDP is an annual metric, but all four are at least compared across that metric, so there is some standardization, and thus this is an apples to apples comparison. And as you can see, the US is the joint lowest of the four with China. Only 31.9% of US GDP is the amount of money printing that has been done. That is the joint lowest of the four. The European Central Bank, even though it's going down, is much higher and got to a point of almost 70%. Even now it's at 56.3%. You would think Germans are the people most afraid of money printing, but no, they actually did twice as much as the United States at one point, and even with their deprinting are way higher. But the highest of all is Japan. It has done four times as much money printing as its annual GDP, 128.7%. And Japan still does not have aberrant inflation. Even the people who are trying to say that the United States has hyperinflation and has had hyperinflation for a very long time, despite all data to the contrary, even those people don't claim that Japan has unusually high inflation. So the people who say money printing causes inflation and then conflate U.S. central bank activity with worldwide inflation and try and oversimplify a complex topic, they really don't know what's going on because Japan has really called the bluff of this entire inflation narrative. And so has Europe to some degree. Money printing is offset by technological deflation and technological deflation is rising exponentially. That is why the amount of money printing that has to be done also has to rise exponentially and it has to get more granular and diffuse. Now to explain that we go to my 2020 scorecard. So this is the scorecard based on what I said on January 1st, 2020 and what the PhD economists of the world who run the central banks as well as other economists throughout institutions like universities and the government, etc., have said. They still thought that money printing was an aberration to stave off a financial crisis and the 2010s decade did $23 trillion of money printing, as you can see from my cursor over here. Therefore, these PhD economists who are still going off of textbooks that are 50 to 70 years old and have no concept of either the accelerating rate of change or of how technology works, they believed that this $23 trillion would be reversed over the course of the 2020s, meaning they'll get back down to zero. The first $23 trillion being reversed, so minus $23 trillion is the net deprinting that they expected in the 2020s. Whereas I said at that time, and longtime viewers know I said that then, that this decade would have 50 to $100 trillion of new money printing just to offset the new technological deflation. $50 trillion in this decade if it is in the form of cash sent directly to people, which I recommend should also offset income tax, but that is a separate topic, or $100 trillion if it is in the form of bond buying. However, this would be very distortive and eventually break a lot of the capital markets correlations because bond buying is already past its useful life as a vehicle for money printing. They have to send cash directly to people. No, that is not socialism. In fact, that's a path to 0% income tax because you're monetizing technological deflation. So I don't want to see any comments about this being socialism. You have to read that Atom Public if that's what you think. And what are the actuals as of June 23rd, 2023? So three and a half years into this decade, more than one third of the way through this decade, plus $8.8 .8 trillion. So is it tracking to their prediction or is it tracking to my prediction? It is tracking closer to my prediction. And remember, this is exponential. We're one third of the way through the timeline, but that does not mean one third of this printing amount has to be done. It is a very backloaded thing. In the later years of this decade, such as 2028 and 2029, we will see much greater amounts of money printing done than anything we have seen before, including during COVID-19. That's when one to $1.5 trillion a month will be seen as normal, and that still will not cause inflation. The price of gold and the price of oil will be the same or even slightly lower than it is today by that time. Now this much cumulative money printing is something that a lot of people like to say will cause inflation and longtime viewers of this channel know why inflation has not appeared. But there's also a simultaneous narrative that inflation is high but is not measured properly which is also false because inflation sells. So to learn more about that we go to part two of this video. 
For this month's update, we, as usual, go to my familiar three measurement matrix, where I try to take a multi-dimensional approach to measuring inflation, thereby diffusing all the claims that a certain index is rigged or a certain measurement is not comprehensive enough or holistic enough. And I've chosen a number that I believe is the best trade-off between avoiding deflation while maximizing technological progress, because technology feeds on inflation. Inflation is in fact a fuel for technology, but we don't want inflation to be higher than 3% because that would be negative for the poorest people in society. Now, if you're of a philosophy that we want technological progress and it's okay if the poorest people starve to death, then yeah, you could advocate for an inflation rate higher than 3%, but I believe that is not a pro-human approach, so we take the happy medium of 3% because it's equally important to avoid deflation. And I take three measurements, the 10-year compound annual growth rate of the US CPI, which is not rigged, even though the people who like to pretend inflation is much higher than it is so that they can feel like victims like to say that it is rigged. It's not rigged because the most important of these three measurements, the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, is comprised of freely traded commodities and it takes the world price. The US CPI is still only a US index. This takes the world price. Therefore, this is the best metric of all and the most comprehensive metric of all. And then the third one is the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield, which is not a measurement of past inflation as much as it is an estimate of future inflation because it governs things like car loan payment rates and mortgage payment rates and so forth. So 3%, 3%, 3%. I need all three of these to be above 3% before I say that inflation is structurally a problem. One of these three being above 3% while the other two are below 3% does not comprise a situation that has high inflation at a structural level. And remember, there's tremendous pressure to pretend that inflation is higher than it is because it has become socially prestigious to pretend that inflation is high. So let's go to the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index first because it's the most important measurement. Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, 10-year compound annual growth rate is minus 1.24% minus 1.24%. It is in deflation and has been a structural deflation for 10 years. This is an index that comprises of oil, natural gas, gold, silver, and a whole bunch of other commodities. It is very comprehensive. These commodities are freely traded and they are priced worldwide. Therefore, there's no chance that this index is rigged or manipulated in any way, and it indicates deflation. The other reason that commodity prices are the best metric of inflation is because commodity prices being low versus high is the one indisputable measurement of where lower is better because there's a very minimal labor component in commodity prices, whereas service price inflation, which is not part of the GSCI, does count, and that's why we look at the CPI, which we're gonna see in a minute, but it's ambiguous about what is good or bad because a service provider charging more means the customer pays more, such as for a haircut or something, but the service provider is simultaneously making more so their wages rose. So in service price inflation, it is very hard to separate rising wages from rising service prices. Therefore, commodity price inflation is the purest measurement and commodity prices affect the price of everything. Now we go to the second measurement, which is the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. 10-year U.S. Treasury yield, 3.855%. So this is above 3%. And it's been above 3% for a while, but it has trouble breaking above 4%. It is hovering in this zone. This is putting a lot of pressure on the U.S. housing market because this makes mortgage rates higher. But for a long time, this was well below 3% as well. And if you go back to the 1970s and 80s, it was much, much higher than this. So 3.855 is the number, very low by historical standards, but above my 3% threshold. So, so far, this is the only one that is above the 3% threshold. And now we go to the final one, the US CPI. This is the US CPI from the BLS.gov website and all of the websites referenced in this video will be in the description box below as usual. And we take the CPI absolute value. You can see this is the chart of the CPI. This is the most recent reading, 303, and you have to divide that by the reading exactly 10 years prior, which is this one, 232. So divide this number by this number and take the one-tenth root of that to get the annualized number. I will show you a table after this that describes exactly what that number is, but that is how you calculate the annualized inflation rate over a 10-year basis. And as we go down the list to different time windows, you'll see how that entire flurry of inflation was not only a non-event, but it's already in the past. 
one month percentage change. You can see that there was this blip for a very short while and now it's moderated back down to this low status quo of structurally low inflation. Two month percentage change, three month percentage change, six month percentage change, and one year percentage change. Some people say only the one year percentage change matters, but they say that when it's high. When it's low, they don't count for that. This inflation event was very brief and a complete non-event because it's falling as fast as it rose. And one should no more fixate on this than they should fixate on when it was low. And that's why the 10-year average is the only number that gives you an accurate, academically rigorous number. Everything else is noise. And this table takes in all of that data we saw from the bls.gov website. The shorter windows of time are more volatile and therefore this number changes around a lot. But an annualized level, this is what the one month, two month, three month readings come out to if you want to take a uniform annual time frame. The one year reading is 4.1%. Everyone was screaming for the short while when it was above 8%, which was for all of three months. That was more than a year ago. The last one year has had 4.1% inflation and it's falling very quickly. It will soon fall to these types of numbers because this is the structural status quo. And then the two year, three year, five year measurements take in that bigger bulge that we saw before, but also tell you more about the structural inflation rates and the effect of COVID relative to pre-COVID. And the most important measurement is the 10 year window, which is still 2.7%. There has been 30.6% CPI inflation over the last 10 years, which comes to 2.7% a year. I'm surprised how few people understand this basic arithmetic. And the one year inflation rate was 4.1%, higher than this 2.7% trend, but it will converge back down to this as we are seeing, because these shorter time windows also have already low numbers. So we go back to my matrix. So we saw the 10 year compound annual growth rate of the US CPI, the 10 year compound annual growth rate of the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, and the 10 year US Treasury yield as of today, June 17th, 2023. What are the numbers? As we saw, the US CPI is at 2.7%, which is still below 3%. The most important measurement of all, the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, is still in deflation, minus 1.24%. I believe the technonomic medium of the world, the atom, has in fact crushed the commodity complex and we can never have commodity price inflation again, no matter how much money is printed. The economy has evolved to a level of sophistication where commodity prices can no longer ever be in inflation. And the 10 year US Treasury yield is the only one that's above 3%. It's at 3.855%. So we'll see what happens over here, but only one of these three is above 3%. I require all of these three to be above 3% before I say that inflation is high. And before we can say that money printing has been excessive, we have still never gotten to the point where money printing has been excessive at any time since quantitative easing began in 2009. So this was the monthly inflation update, and I hope you found this informative. Tune out all the garbage media content about inflation, which has caused some people to outright lose their minds and see inflation everywhere. Don't listen to them because those are people who cannot parse data in an unemotional way and see what the facts really are. But if you're watching this channel, you're doing better than most on that front. Thanks for watching.